James 1.27 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress. Katie Davis Majors did just that. As a late teenager, she went to Uganda on a missions trip and ended up going back to adopt 13 Ugandan young ladies and became their mother. She's moved there from Nashville and she demonstrates what heroic faith looks like and also what pure religion looks like as well. This is a great story of courage. You're going to be impacted by it. Enjoy. Katie Davis Majors says there are certain things that adoptive parents understand that bio parents just can't fully appreciate. What better way to clearly understand God's heart for us than to bring a child who is not biologically related to you into your home and call them your own and believe that they're your own. I now have adopted children and a biological child, and I can say with certainty that my love for them is the same. This is Family Life Today. Our host is Dennis Ramey, and I'm Bob Lapine. There's a lot we can learn as followers of Jesus when we go near the orphan or those in need. We'll hear more about that today from Katie Davis Majors. Stay with us. And welcome to Family Life Today. Thanks for joining us. I was uh, coming back from a trip recently, and I was grousing about the poor condition of the airplane I was on. It's an older plane. Seats were kind of hard, and, you know, it was. Uh, I was cramped up. And I, I went on Twitter, and I just oh, groused. Oh, you belly ached? I belly ached. To the whole world. Oh, and oh to the goodness. particular airline in oh, question. Oh, really? I, I called them out and said, it's time to upgrade your planes. And a friend of mine tweeted back at me, and he said, you need to fly to better destinations. And I tweeted back to him. I said, there's no better destination than home. Ooh. Yeah. So wherever there you go, there's, yeah, be it ever so humble, there's no place there's like, like home, home, right? Well, I, I have to ask this because she was snickering as you were telling that story. It's like, <laughs> you don't have any idea about the condition. What a bad of, airline is. Yeah. <laughs> Katie Davis Majors joins us on the broadcast. Katie lives in Uganda can you tell tell us a story of of a flight on an airplane in or Uganda? Or even a road, maybe. <laughs> We're driving a car down a road oh, exactly. is probably just as bad. <laughs> yeah, the only time that I get on an airplane in Uganda would be to fly overseas. So then the airplane isn't terrible, but the condition of the roads is is not great. Well, I think uh, I think there's no question that uh, we're spoiled here in America I think with, you're with right. all of our services. Katie is the author of a new book called Daring to Hope, Finding God's Goodness in the Broken and the Beautiful. And she is a mom to 14, the wife to one, Benji, which is yes. a great story in of itself. And uh, they've had a little boy of their own named Noah. And this is a book about really finding God through the interruptions of life, what we mm-hmm. would call an interruption. Bob was interrupted by the, the seat in his airplane. <laughs> you were interrupted one, uh, one day by a guy who was on your doorstep by the name of Mac. And uh, you, you generally have taken care of girls, but right. this is a guy right. who needed help. Yeah, Mac was brought to me from one of the communities that we work in by a social worker on our staff. She had found him and he had been severely burnt. His leg, you could almost see the bone. It had been burnt so badly and so deeply. And, you know, I thought I knew Mac. He was... He was the village alcoholic. He was the guy that was getting in my way on my way to Bible study. He was the guy who was yelling profanities, and I would cover my children's ears. And and I had shrugged him off as an annoyance, as that kind of person. And so when she showed up with him, my my sweet social worker, Christine, I kind of shook my head at her, but he was badly hurt. So we proceeded to three different hospitals, and we were told all three times that his leg would have to be amputated 
because it was so badly injured. And the hospitals in Uganda where we live are pretty understaffed and very under-resourced. So the doctor explained to me that his leg did have a chance if somebody could bandage it and dress it every single day. But he said, my nursing staff here with this many patients, we just, we don't have enough gauze. We don't have strong enough antibiotics. We won't be able to do this every day. If you'd like, I can show you how and you can do it at home. And I I said, okay, which is funny to me now. You know, sometimes you wonder like, okay, God, what? How did I? <laughs> I did. Come out of my mouth? I said that was fine. <laughs> but I did. We, um, we've been privileged over the last many years. The house that we live in has a really simple guest house in the back. It's really just a line of small rooms. And so we do have a place where it is safe to let other people live. They're not inside our home. And so... Yeah, that's one of my first thoughts. What's a what's a guy like this going to do in the house with so many young ladies? Right. And so that's why I, I felt safe about the fact that we had some good separation between our house and the guest home. And I have people like social workers on my staff who are able to come and help out with this sort of thing. But he stayed. He wasn't actually allowed to come up to the main house. So I would go back there on the porch of his room every day and dress his wound. And Slowly, he he began to sober up, and just this really gentle, genuine side of him came out, and he began to tell me his story of all the tragic things that had happened in his life that had led him to this point, and God really just gave me such a compassion for him that he—none of us—we don't get to our brokenness just because, you know, really terrible things had happened to him that had led him to this place, and so as I changed his wound each day— for almost an entire year. It was about 10 months, maybe closer (laughs) to 11, that I was changing that dressing. And so every day for about an hour, he would tell me little pieces of his story, and I would share with him little pieces of the gospel and how I really believed that not only was God going to make his leg whole, but God was going to make all of us whole. And we had just endured some loss in our family. We had lost a foster daughter that had lived with us for a long time. And I really think as I watched Mac's leg heal, that God was doing a lot of healing in my heart. And that as I testified to Mac, who I had known Jesus to be, God was really having me say some of those things to remind myself of what I believed. So how could you do that? I mean, seriously, bring a total stranger in there. What was the motivation? What was the heart that caused you to care for that guy for 12 months? It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't the first time we had had a stranger in dire need show up and need a place to stay. For Mac, I think, um, I think I was looking for healing. I was looking for redemption. I had not seen a happy ending in my family's story recently as we had lost one of our daughters to the foster care system. And I I wanted to believe that God would heal this wound and I wanted to watch it happen. And through that, God did a lot of healing in my own life. He definitely healed Mac's leg. A year later, Mac was up walking around the yard, raking our leaves for us, taking out our trash, just a, like a dependable, fun uncle for the kids. He had gotten a job at a local dentist. He's a dental assistant now. And actually, my friend Benji, who was just a friend at the time and was doing men's ministry in the area, I had reached out to him and said, hey, I don't usually have guys around, but there's this man that's ended up living in our guest house, and he needs a man to be discipling him. Would you be willing to come do that? So Benji began meeting with him multiple times a week for several hours, just studying the word together. And about a year and a half after Mac had moved in with us, he put his trust in Jesus. He walked into my kitchen and he said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And then he turned around and walked out. And I stood in the kitchen (laughs) and just cried and yelled and he was so excited. You you know, Katie, I I have a a picture in my head of the gospel being proclaimed in, I don't know if it's Uganda, but in parts of Africa, sadly, sometimes a shallow consumeristic gospel Mm -hmm. making promises, Mm -hmm. and then shallow conversions that are momentary. And uh, it's it's like, we'll try this witch doctor because the last one wasn't so good. Talk a little bit about 
the ministry of the gospel that you're involved with and what you're trying to do to counteract uh, what's going on in lots of places in Africa. You're absolutely right. We see a lot of that, the shallow conversion. Everybody's looking for an answer, right? So might as well try this out. These people say that it can work. Um, it, it's difficult to to be white in an African country and and proclaiming the gospel because you want people to come to the gospel for the gospel, not because of something that they think mm-hmm. you might offer them. And so, you know, we've seen two things in ministry that we are both very passionate about and that Amazima as a whole is very passionate about. One is just relational ministry, one-on-one over a very long period of time, discipleship through studying scripture together. Another is equipping locals. We have some expatriate staff, but we have mostly Ugandan staff. And the goal of the expatriate staff is really just to equip the Ugandan staff with good, deep theology and the true word of God so that the Ugandan staff members can be the ones discipling, especially the children in our program. Mm -hmm. So all of the families and children in our programs are assigned a mentor who's a social worker, and they are all Ugandan. And so as an expatriate, we are really kind of behind the scenes trying to encourage these Ugandan leaders to be the people sharing the gospel because I feel like it's more well-received. And I think I say this a lot. You can pour all the money and all the resources and build all the buildings and have all the projects. But in 10 years in Uganda— The stories where I see true life change are people who have had a one-on-one relationship with someone who is pointing them to Christ. I think relational ministry is where it's at. What you're talking about, I I remember a few years ago reading the book When Helping Hurts, which Mm -hmm. I know you've read. Yes. That's a part of the thesis. We have, in in this country, we have a desire to want to help, Mm -hmm. and yet we we can throw a lot of resources at stuff that's actually counterproductive. Yeah, and let's be serious. Helping feels good. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not just about the person I'm helping. It fills me up as well. And I believe that God intended it that way, that, that giving would be joyful and that acts of mercy would be done cheerfully. But I also think we need we need to walk with wisdom in that and how to best steward the gospel to a different people. Katie, I know you believe this, but one of the things Barbara and I have really attempted to champion is uh, encouraging believers, followers of Christ, to get involved in the foster care system Mm, of our nation. You've been deeply involved in foster care. And to go back to what Bob said earlier, if you want to help someone, there is a natural way right now because there's almost 500,000 children in America. You don't have to go to Uganda to find one of them, many of whom are going to age out of the system Mm -hmm. without a parent. Barbara, we just had a a delightful dinner with a man who's got a passion for this as well. We did. We had dinner a couple of weeks ago with a pastor whose name is Bishop Martin, and he and his wife have adopted a number of young men and women out Mm -hmm. of the foster care system, and he is passionate about us doing that as a body of Christ in America. In fact, our oldest daughter has been involved in fostering children for years, and they've had, I don't know how many, 23, 25 children through their house, and two of them they've ended up adopting. Mm -hmm. So it has really opened our eyes. We adopted, too. One of our six is adopted, but we didn't do foster care. And we have such a passion to see families welcome these children. The complaint that our daughter Ashley hears all the time, and I hear it as well, is that would be too hard, Mm. and it would hurt too much to give them up. And I think this book that you've written will really help address that because I think we shy away because of the pain of entering into someone's life. But when we do back off from entering into someone's life, whether it's a foster child or whether it's helping someone like you did, Mac, we don't realize that we're cutting ourselves off from knowing God in a way that we would not apart from that experience. And so... I I love it that you're doing foster care in Uganda and bringing children into your home and writing about it so that maybe more American families will address the need that's right under our noses in our own backyards Um, because there are so many children who need to be touched, who need to be loved, who need to understand what a relationship is like. They've been shuttled around Mm -hmm. for for years, and um, it's a ripe opportunity that God has in front of us, and I hope people will consider it. 
I agree. And what a tangible way to mm-hmm. get involved right where you are in your own community. It's certainly as much of a need here in the States exactly. as it is in Uganda. There are children hurting world over. And so that's that's one of the things that I really always hope to encourage people in is that you don't have to move to Uganda. That's you don't right. have to move anywhere. There are people in need right in front of you. Right. But you do need to open your heart. Yes. And that, I think, is what most people are afraid of, is opening their heart because they they know that there might be some pain involved. And we're, we're so pain averse and mm-hmm. we're so addicted to comfort that it keeps us from from opening our hearts and then consequently experiencing God in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. Katie, I've said for years that when you go near the orphan, Mm -hmm. you go near the heart of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. How have you experienced that personally? Because you've adopted 13 Ugandan young ladies. Well, what better way to clearly understand God's heart for us than to bring a child who is not biologically related to you into your home And call them your own and believe that they're your own. I now have adopted children and a biological child. And I can say with certainty that my love for them is the same. Mm -hmm. And because I know that to be true, I can believe God when he says that through Jesus Christ, I am adopted as his son or daughter, Mm -hmm. just as Christ is his son. I mean, it's really, it's unfathomable, mm-hmm. isn't it? But I believe mm-hmm. it's, such a cl- it's such a clear picture. You know, I desire the world for my adopted daughters. And I, I believe that that's God's heart towards us, this father heart. And I don't think I would be able to so clearly understand it had I not experienced the love that I have for my children. We couldn't agree more because yeah. we, we experienced the same thing with our adopted daughter yeah. because we we chose her mm-hmm. we welcomed her we love her the same as we love our other children and you know she brought a different set of issues in our lives that our biological yes. children did or would have if we had just had them but oh the the depth of what we know about God's love and his yes. consistency with us and his never turning his back mm. on us when in our flesh sometimes we want to do that, and yet experiencing that relationship for now 33 years has been one of the greatest gifts in our lives because of what we have learned about God as our Father. Absolutely. that I, It's so beautiful, mm-hmm. just the way that he does that. I love that you use the word chose. I mean, I think that's hmm. such a beautiful thing about adoption is I chose you intentionally. Yes. Mm-hmm. I chose to love you. And that's how God feels about us. Yeah, and He chose us. I'm Mm -hmm. studying Romans right now, and even in the very first few verses, He talks about chosen by God, and I just love that Mm -hmm. because it makes you realize how loved you are to be chosen out of billions. Why why would He choose me? I have no earthly idea, but it says in His Word that He chose me, and understanding that now that we've chosen ourselves to love it, uh, to adopt and love, makes me appreciate and value so much more the choosing love of God toward me as an individual. Me it's it's profound and like nothing else. Katie, you've been in Uganda for a decade. Yes. You left Nashville to go there as somebody who knew and loved Jesus. How is your understanding of what the gospel is different today than it was when you got on the plane and said, I'm going to Uganda? It's very different. I I think my faith when I set out as an 18-year-old with my suitcase full of construction paper and crayons and my heart that was going to change the world for the gospel of Christ, you know, I I think my faith was a bit naive, definitely. You, You think? At 18? I just yes, want to make sure I'm our listeners sure. heard, heard what you just said. A bit. A bit naive. A bit. I mean, your parents had to let you go, they for did. goodness sakes, yes. at the age of 18 to Uganda. Mm-hmm. They had to wonder if you were a bit off at that point, right? Right. Yeah. And I, I think I was I was very optimistic as well. I think I, I saw God's goodness to be... When things turned out well or when my prayers were answered or uh-huh. when things were yeah. were going my way, then I would say like, oh, see, God blessed us. And I just, I've really 
I mean, I do believe that the greatest gift God gives us is himself, Mm -hmm. um, salvation and eternal life with him. That's Mm -hmm. what he wants to give us. There's no material thing. There's no earthly blessing. It's him. And I have seen that God has given me more and more of himself, even in the midst of unimaginable hardship. Yeah. And he knows that's what we need yes. most. He knows that what, that is what will satisfy most. Yes. And in the end, that is the very best gift. We just don't see it on the front end because I was naive and so thinking that we would change the world when we were in our early 20s and newly married and we were going to change the world and Jesus was coming back and we'd probably never even have kids because it was going to happen so fast, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, over the years, we've learned the same thing, that it is, it's all about knowing Him and having that relationship with Him and nothing else matters. Nothing else is important. And it's really fun to watch that happen through reading your book in your life at an earlier age. And it's because you've been face-to-face with things that a lot of people don't bump into until they're maybe 30s, 40s, 50s. Right. So it's really quite quite amazing that you've you've been able to understand that and learn that by the time you're 30. That's remarkable. When you share the gospel today with people in Uganda, how is it different than when you shared the gospel a decade ago? I mean, I, I think I definitely am more quick to present the fact that belief in Jesus does not mean that things are going to go well. And belief in Jesus does not mean that your garden is going to grow or that you're not going to live in a dirt house anymore. But belief in Jesus means that you will have someone with you through those circumstances and that those circumstances will just be so temporary in light of eternity. There is nothing here that what we're putting our hope in. And belief in the gospel doesn't really mean that we have hope in this world now. It means that we have hope for eternity spent with God. We talked earlier about Romans 8, but it goes on to say that the sufferings of this world cannot compare to the glory that is ahead. And uh, Paul calls them light and momentary afflictions, right? Yeah, he does. And in the midst of life, you're going to have these messes that you're talking about that hurt, Mm -hmm. that disappoint, because people will disappoint you. Yes, But what you're saying and what you're reminding us of is that God shows up and he desires to be our refuge. And uh, one of the one of the things I found as I was reading your book was uh, you were really counseling your own soul. Yes. As you sat as you stood there in your kitchen, peeling mounds of potatoes, cleaning dishes, Mm -hmm. cleaning up after the girls. But you were counseling your soul with the Psalms, with the scripture so that you were responding the way God wanted you to respond, realizing he was there with you. Mm -hmm. And I love the Psalms because they're so honest. I I think we're sometimes conditioned to think that we can't come to God and tell him, I feel so disappointed or I feel so angry, right? We think we're only supposed to say, okay, I'm upset with God, but let me find something that I can thank him for or something good. But we see in the Psalms, the psalmist cries out Mm -hmm. to God. He tells him how he feels. And when I approached God in that way, I felt that God did not become angry with me back. You know, maybe when you approach a human with anger, you expect they're going to yell back at you, right? But God didn't feel angry. He understood what I felt. He already knew that I felt that way. And he was able to comfort me all the more when I was honest with him. Well, uh, as I was reading your book, I was reflecting back on a psalm, Psalm 43, Mm. especially one verse that has been meaningful to me recently. Maybe it will be meaningful to a listener or two. It reads, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? That's honesty right there. Mm -hmm. That's admitting Mm -hmm. where you are. goes on to say, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. God desires to be our refuge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's got a knock the props out from under us of where we're looking for encouragement, where we're looking, as you talk about, Katie, in your book, Daring to Hope, where we're hoping for a good ending to the story, and we don't get that good ending. And what God's doing is he's driving us to himself. So if you want to counsel your soul, take a look at all five verses of Mm -hmm. chapter 43 uh, of the Psalms. 
And I think for folks to read Katie's book and be reminded of the things she has learned caring for adopted kids living in Uganda, I think there's a lot of encouragement, a lot of hope in this book. The book is called Daring to Hope, Finding God's Goodness in the Broken and the Beautiful. And we've got copies of the book in our Family Life Today Resource Center. You can order from us online at familylifetoday.com or call 1-800-FL-TODAY. Again, our website, familylifetoday.com. The phone number, 1-800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. I was with one of our listeners recently who uh, said, I know when Family Life Today went on the air, he said it was 25 years ago. And the reason I know that is because that's when we started having children, right about the same time that Family Life Today began as a radio broadcast. And he said, all along the journey, I have leaned into you guys for counsel, for wisdom, for help, for advice on how we can raise our kids. And he smiled and he said, and you know, they've, they've turned out okay. And as you know, Dennis, there's no guarantee that kids turn out okay, even when mom and dad do the best they know how to do. But it is encouraging to hear from moms and dads, from husbands and wives who tell us repeatedly that this program has made a difference in their understanding of marriage and family and in how they're living it out. And I wish those of you who support Family Life Today, both as legacy partners and those of you who will give an occasional donation to support this ministry, I wish you could hear some of these testimonies that we get a chance to hear. These are the people you're supporting when you support this broadcast. You're helping to turn around legacies. You're helping to point families in new directions. And we're grateful for your partnership with us. Here at Year End, we have a unique opportunity for your giving to go farther. And our friend Michelle Hill is here again today with an update on Family Life's Matching Gift Fund. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Bob. Yes, I reported yesterday how the fund might be doubling. Well, the matching fund is $4.3 million, which is fantastic. But what has to happen next is up to our listeners, because without you, that $4.3 million figure is just a number. So please pray about your part in fulfilling the match, because right now we're at $729,000, and that's quite a gap to fill in just a couple of weeks. So please keep praying, keep giving, and to God be the glory. And we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you to make a year-end contribution to Family Life Today. You can do it online at familylifetoday.com, or you can call 1-800-FL-TODAY to donate, or you can mail your donation to Family Life Today at Box 7111, Little Rock, Arkansas, and our zip code is 72223. Now, tomorrow, we want to find out how Katie Davis became Katie Davis Majors and hear about the young man who pursued her in Uganda and ultimately got her to say yes to his proposal. I hope you can tune in for that story. I want to thank our engineer today, Keith Lynch, along with our entire broadcast production team. On behalf of our host, Dennis Rainey, I'm Bob Lapine. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life of Little Rock, Arkansas, a crew ministry. Help for today. Hope for tomorrow.